Hello, cool. Today I have with me the man widely known for his role on Ninja Turtles and is the voice of the main character in The Tick, Mr. Townsend Coleman. Hey, 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 what are you kids doing in there? We're just talking to you, sir. <laughs> oh, hello. What can I do for you? Well, we're here to interview you, sir. All right. Let me see what I got here. Hold on just a moment. I think I have uh, something here to... Write this down. Oh, wait, I don't have to write this down. You're interviewing me. I already what? wrote it down. Oh, geez. Okay, go ahead then. All right. Uh, so, first off, uh, how did you get started in voice acting? Oh, goodness gracious. Well, let me see. Um, back in high school, I started uh, getting into theater in uh, junior high and started doing a lot of theater. And then um, in my early 20s, uh, got into radio. Him a uh, radio DJ back in Cleveland, Ohio for 10 years and uh, did a lot of theater during that time as well and um, started getting into voiceovers. And so when I moved out to California in, uh, almost 30 years ago in 1984, uh, really my goal coming out here was to be an actor, you know, doing TV and film and stuff. But because I'd done so much voiceover work back in Cleveland – um, I started doing some of that, you know, just to sort of make ends meet. And it became my career. I had a fluke audition for a show called Inspector Gadget hmm. in 1985 and uh, got this part, a little part uh, at the right at the end of the series. And and that sort of launched me in a whole new direction, something I'd uh, never even uh, intended on going. And uh, was it what was it like when you got your first role? Was it like exciting or were you worried? Uh well, I can't say I was worried. Uh, yeah, I definitely was excited. I just, I didn't know what to expect. I didn't know what I was looking at, you know, and I thought, uh, because I, I, you know, I'd done a lot of, you know, sort of um, wacky character stuff on some of the radio stations that I'd worked at. Uh, and and so when you audition for something, and it was a brand new experience for me because I didn't know how you auditioned for these things. I just showed up and they showed me a picture of the character and a little description of, you know, you know, what the character was like and some sample lines. And so I looked at the character and it immediately gave me an impression on what I thought he might sound like. And so I did that and they laughed and liked it. And so we just sort of took it from there and they ended up book. And uh, yeah, so, I mean, yes, I was really excited, um, more intrigued than anything else. It's like, oh, this is new <laughs> uh, i'll give give this a try and uh and and so i had a blast uh doing that yeah met some incredible people on that first session maurice lamarche was uh on the series uh, at the time yeah uh, frank welker of course and uh don adams and uh, so it was just the four of us in the studio in that first session i went to and um it, as i look back on it now it's, it's a, a a pretty watershed day for me um, and, uh, yeah, real exciting. And were you aware of the other people's like work at the time? Were you aware of Frank or Maurice's work at the time? No, I, I had never heard of them before. Um, and it, only because I just was kind of not into that world, you know, following, um, cartoon voices and, and such. And, uh, Maurice was fairly new in the business uh, at the time, as I recall, cause I think Inspector Gadget was his first, uh, animated series and of course frank welker was a legend um that i was just unaware of at the time however i was familiar with his work um on inspector gadget only because i had uh three young kids at the time and uh, back when and this was only six months after we moved from ohio mm. so that i got this part so when we were still back in ohio my kids would watch inspector gadget and i w remember making sort of a mental note Man, the guy who whoever does that, the voice of that 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 big voice of Doctor Claw, um, has got to be just like an enormous guy, and 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 that was that. So here I am, you know, six months later, sitting in the studio with him, and sitting literally next to him, and uh, looking through the script as we're about to um, do a read through for the for that uh, first session I was on, and and I saw that there were some Doctor Claw lines coming up in the script and I figured well we'll just skip those because none of these guys here <laughs> is the guy that could be doing that huge voice um, and so when we got to that line in the script assuming that we were just going to you know fly past it 
all of a sudden, you know, Frank opens his mouth and out falls this incredible voice, <laughs> this, the, 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 this sound that I just took me so by surprise, I gasped, I mean, out loud and looked at him and I just, I laughed and I said, that's you. And, uh, and he laughed and, and, uh, yeah, I mean, that was boy, what an eye opener that was. So, so yeah, I, I wasn't really familiar with, um, their work, but in a way I kind of was familiar with his work and then all of a sudden became really aware of his work, uh, you know, working with him. It's funny. If I, if I looked over at Frank, the first time I heard that voice, I would have said, how are your vocal cords still intact? (laughs) Yes. Like with a voice like that. Yeah. 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 Well, I think Frank has a, has vocal cords of leather. Oh, he was also doing Megatron at the time, and that's another really strenuous voice on yeah, him. Yeah, so. Megatron and and all the screaming for for Spock's uh, screams and all that stuff. All right, yeah. and now on to the I got some of the Ninja Turtle questions. <laughs> uh oh, okay. All right. all right, so first off, um, I noticed that um, each of you guys on the show, Barry, Cam, Rob, you, mm-hmm. uh, you all did not just the main characters. You did some characters off, like Rob was was a uh, mutagen man you were a razor and you all did different characters and was it spur of the moment that you guys had to do that stuff or do you remember like or could you just not find somebody to do the voice oh no well uh, th- those are what we call incidental characters um in, in an episode of a, a show so um typically the way it works uh in animation is they for a contract they get you for x number of voices and back in those days as i recall they 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 got us for for one contract. They got us for three voices um, per episode. So w- w- what that means is that they could have us do three voices, and not have to pay us any more than the one contract that they were paying us. You know, session fee that they were paying us for that that episode. And um, and so what they would do is, you know, the Sue Blue, the director, would go through the script and with the producers w- would decide. You know who would do what voices because there would be you know smaller characters or or or, or lesser characters than the main characters uh, that would crop up in you know just about any episode and so they would go and and see who was going to be in the in the recording session that day which actors were going to be at the session for that day and uh, and then they would just basically split up the voices and uh, you know it was a it was sort of a, a crapshoot, you know. Uh, Susie would just uh, toss out a voice and say, you know, Tony, why don't you take this, uh, you know, take that thug number three, you know, in the bank. Um, and so then that would be my line. As as far as lines or characters that kind of came up, you know, more often, um, uh, you know what, to be honest, Michael, I don't remember exactly how they cast those. I mean, because a lot of times it seemed like it was just a, a spur of the moment, you know, you know, here, Rob, why don't you, you take this guy, then it would become a regular character uh, or a recurring character, I should say. Um, and, uh, you know, so, I mean, they, they would just sort of dole them out. Um, you know, I remember there were times when they would have us, you know, read a little sample and, and sort of audition on the spot uh, for some characters just to hear what they sound like, what we would each come up with. And then, um, divvy it up that way but um yeah but mo- most often uh, i think that they would just um uh what was your question <laughs> i'm like i think i've answered it but uh yeah yeah you have okay but uh, all right um when you <laughs> you just keep me on track boy i, I will and there you go all right um when you did michelangelo was there a because it's kind of a surfer dude voice, but did you have a person that you based it off, or did you just think of a surfer dude when you did it? Well, yeah, I I wasn't real familiar with the whole surfer dude genre, only because I was from Cleveland, Ohio, and you know we weren't. I w- wasn't right next to a beach uh, that had surf, um, and certainly not anywhere near California. So I wasn't real familiar with that. You know that 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 whole world. Um, but what I had in my head was sort of the Sean Penn, uh, you know, Spicoli character from, uh, Fast Times at Ridgemont High, just ah. sort of a, a burnt out, you know, but they didn't want Mike, Michelangelo, you know, that burnt out, that <laughs> burnt out at all. I should say okay, they, that, they, they just, funny. they just wanted him, you know, uh, just a party dude, a surf, you know, a kind of a surfer dude. And back in those days, I remember when I first came to town, 
you know, the Valley Girls or, you know, the, and the whole Valley speak was was popular in the mid 80s there. And uh, that was something that was new to me, too. So it was, you know, sort of the kind of that whole realm they wanted, you know, Michelangelo to be sort of a, you know, all right, you know, kind of laid back and, you know, no problem, oh, dude, you know, kind of thing. Yeah. And um, and 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 so that's kind of where I took that from. And, you know, the, as with any character that we end up doing, they sort of evolve over time uh, as as you do the character and you kind of find a, a little more, you know, to it that you can maybe resonate with and make it your own. So but from the very start, um, yeah, I was a, it was probably uh, um, uh, Sean Penn that was was the. Uh, was the prototype for me. Hmm. And I know when I, um, there was the 2003 Ninja Turtles and their finale had all the eighties villains and main characters. And none of you guys had returned to do your roles for that. They had to find vocal replacements. And was there, do you know if there was a reason behind that? Like you couldn't do that. Now, are you talking about a, the series or are you talking about this thing called it, turtles forever? Yeah. Turtles forever. Yeah, no. I mean, it, you say they they vocal replacements. They didn't have to find vocal replacements. They chose to find vocal replacements only because that my 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 understanding is that that was a non-union gig, and we're all union actors, and they didn't want to pay union actors, and so they they chose to find you know replacements you know to sort of loosely do our voices. Um, yeah. So, I mean, they never even called us about that. So. All right. And um, I know when I was watching the newer series, because um, uh, halfway through the second season of the newer series, they had you, Cam and Barry come back to play your roles in a little cameo part, <laughs> <laughs> which yeah. I thought that was fantastic. Yeah, but, yeah, yeah. It was fun. But uh, what what was it like working with all those guys again? Oh, my gosh. It, it, it was just great, you know, sort of being back in the in the turtle suit again. Um, after all these years and, um, I, we had, we had seen each other, um, because Rob, uh, of course has, you know, his, uh, a podcast, uh, talking tunes uh, with Rob Paulson and Rob had kindly, um, asked the three of us to come together along with, uh, Pete Renaday, who was Splinter and Renee Jacobs, uh, who was April and also Sue Blue, the director, voice director, um, to do his podcast, um, a couple of years ago. And uh, so we got together for dinner, the four of us, um, just to sort of chat about that um, before we did his podcast. And that was actually the first time that the four of us, I think, had been together since we did the series, since we ended the series in the, um, you know, sort of 96 or 97, whenever that was. Yeah. And um, uh, 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 maybe a year or two earlier, we had done... Um, we had gotten together over at Kevin Eastman's house for this a documentary that they had been uh, putting together um, and that I think is coming out this summer. I think that's coming out this year because I remember hearing about that a while back. Yeah, yeah. I think they they finally got the okay to go ahead and finish this thing. I, I think, think it's coming were. around the time of the new movie, actually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So maybe in another month or so. And um, so that documentary is finally coming out. But but the uh, – but um, when we were um, – when we were, rec were recording and, and taking some uh, pictures and doing some video for that documentary there in town, we did it over at Kevin Eastman's house. And that was the first time that any of us had gotten together. Um, but unfortunately, Cam couldn't make it until later that evening uh, to do his part in that after most of us had already left. So we, at that point, we almost all came together for the first time in years. Um, most of us were together. I, I, Cam was there. I mean, uh, uh, Barry was there and Rob and me and, and, uh, uh, even, even Brian Tochi was there. Um, James Avery was there. Um, Pete Renaday was there. Uh, uh, Renee was there. So it was great, um, seeing them at that point, but th we still didn't have all four turtles together because Cam couldn't make till later that night. So it wasn't until, um, getting together for Rob's podcast that the four of us were actually together uh, again after all these years. Now we had seen each other individually because we all still work in the business and, and, you know, work on, on different shows and stuff. And, um, 
but uh, yeah, but that was that was a, a a a blast coming together. So so for this thing for Nickelodeon uh, for the current series, when we we did our little cameos, actually we didn't come together for that because I remember the day that I went down to Nick. Um, the only other guy who was there was Barry. It was just me and Barry, mm. and so we went in and recorded our uh, uh, you know handful of lines of dialogue um, together in the studio and, you know, it took us all of 15 minutes and we were done and out of there. So I didn't see Rob at that point and didn't see Cam at that point. Um, and they, well, of course, Rob's on the show anyway, as Donatello, but, um, so I'm not sure when he did his and then uh, Cam picked his lines up at some point as well. So, so, but, but it was, it was really great just sort of being back, you know, as part of the turtles franchise, um, and, and seeing, you know, the four of us together on screen again in a sort of a new iteration. And it was a, it was a, a clever way of doing it. I thought, uh, did you, did you meet the newer ones? Did you meet like Sean and Jason? And you, so you didn't get to meet any of them. No. And I've, I've met Sean before. Um, and I met Greg Sipes before at a, uh, uh, you know, a, a convention. Uh, but, um, but I uh, never met Jason Biggs. And like I said, when we went in to do our, our parts, uh, none of them were there. It was, it was literally just me and Barry uh, right. going in and doing our, our lines in the studio. All right. And I got, um, if you've seen anything from the film, what are your thoughts like from what you've seen, like the well, new one? Well, it seems, in, it seems intriguing to me. I, you know, I'm not uh, deep into Turtles lore and and even you know though i was a integral part of that that first a series back in the 80s and um, 90s um you know i i mean i i i'm i'm not i'm not so diehard a fan that i'm either you know for it or against it of course i'd like to see the thing succeed i like seeing fans happy um i know that there was a great deal of controversy surrounding you know michael bay's decision early on to make some changes regarding their backstory and stuff. Um, but the, the trailer that I saw, I thought looked pretty awesome. And, you know, and, and, and so I, you know, just as sort of a casual, um, you know, audience member, I, I, I think it looks like it could be very entertaining. Cause if you, have you seen any of his like transformers movies? Or anything? Uh-huh. Yeah. Ed, like, have it, you- but again, uh, you know, not not being such a, a diehard Transformers fan, fan, I, you know, I, I, I go just for the entertainment um, uh, of it. If right. that makes any sense to you, you know, I'm not going going. Well, hey, that's not right. You know, that sucks. He should have done. You know, whatever. I, I, that's just not me. I, I go and it, it's either an entertaining movie or not. You know, and so I saw a couple of the Transformers films, but uh, right. All right, now we're. I can get into the other stuff now, like other than the Ninja Turtles, because I just wanted to get that off my chest first. <laughs> All I right, the, dude. I well, is it off your chest? Yes. Okay. Yes. Where right. did it go? <laughs> it's not on your chest anymore. It's, it's got to be somewhere. It's on the it's on the ground somewhere. All right, dude. Well, watch your step. <laughs> you don't All right. step in it. All right. Um. All right. With the now, I got to bring up the tech. Because that's that's, ar- that's arguably one of your other most well-known roles. Arguably. And, yep. Yes. <laughs> yes. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. Here we go. Right. I am the tick. Gene. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, gross. Gene. Evil is a foot. Well, that's good enough. You got an action figure or something? Yeah, I, I do. It's my big blue. Well, of course it'd be blue. Sixteen-inch talking tick. Whose torso has badly discolored? Oh no! What happened? Ah, it glitched for a second. <laughs> it glitched for a second. Yeah, the audio glitched for a split second. That's that's fine. Evil right, glitch. <laughs> I am the tick. <laughs> All right. So when you did the series of the tick, were you aware of the comics at the time, or did you not really have a knowledge of the character? Again, you know, not being, and this is got to be a sore disappointment to you, I'm sure, but not being a huge comics fan, um, I wasn't aware of the the tick until I auditioned for it, Mm. you know, and then once I auditioned for it and got it, then 
yeah, then I uh, picked up some of the comics just to sort of get a sense of what they were about. But uh, I, you know, got to talk to Ben Edlund, the, the creator of the Tick, um, early on in the process, and uh, and uh, you know, and 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 so got a, a pretty good sense of kind of you know what his head was about um, re- regarding the character and regarding the show. Hmm. As I was with the whole comics thing, I was going to bring up because I noticed when I was looking through your filmography, you've done a lot of DC animated stuff, like a lot of it. And okay. I was just because you've done something, I think, almost every series when I was looking at your filmography. And I just thought I'm picking up on a theme here. And I, was, <laughs> so I was just wondering if maybe it was because you liked working with Warner Brothers or something. I just like working, period. Mm. Yeah. So, you know, and, and, the, and the way it works in this, you know, listen, I, I know that there are a lot of folks who, who a lot of guys who and, and girls who come to town, you know, being huge fans of one thing or another. And, and all they want to do is work on, you know, X, Y, Z, because they grew up, you know, as a fan of X, Y, Z. And that's their life's goal now. Um, like I said, you know, I I I was, a, you know, a, sort of a TV kid of the of the sixties and, um, you know, watching TV back then. And, and so grew up watching cartoons back then. But like I said, when I moved to town, uh, at 30 years old, I, I wasn't, I wasn't, I wasn't hankering to be in doing cartoons. You know what I'm saying? Right. So, so it wasn't like I had, you know, this, this real Jones on to, 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 to do Spider-Man or, or something like that. Um, I just fell into the the whole cartoon thing. And then once I did and realized what a blast it was and what cool people were, you know, in this business and, 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 and the voice actors that I encountered in being just the, the nicest, most down to earth, most hilarious, most facile, you know, um, quick witted, uh, um, folks, um, I thought, man, you know, I told my agent to send me out of more of this stuff. I, you know, this, this is fun stuff. And, um, and so that's what it was, you know, it was just more a matter of me auditioning for anything that they'd send me out on an audition for. So, so whatever, um, so whatever, you know, theme you think you might see, you know, back in, in a filmography of me, you know, doing a bunch of DC comics, um, is purely coincidental. I was going to say, cause I was wondering if it was a coincidence or maybe you just really liked working with DC stuff. Uh, well, I, 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 the answer is yes to both those things. I mm-hmm. like working on DC stuff, but it is a coincidence and I like working on anything that anybody will hire me for. So, you know, so, you know, right. and, back, and you also got to understand that, you know, back 30 years ago, uh, 25 years ago, the, the, the sort of relative talent pool here in LA uh, was pretty small. You know, and and so the it was a pretty tight knit community, and there weren't that many folks. We sort of all tended up tended to end up knowing each other, um, you know, from one show to the next, and we often worked with each other on different different shows. Um, you know, I mean, I've probably worked with Rob Paulson, um, or I should say, Rob and I have worked together more series and shows that I've done. Than on anything, uh, than on than, than on anything else. How am I trying to say this? I've worked with Rob probably more than any but any other single person in all the shows that I've done, you know. And and we've worked on so many shows together, you know, since the mid '80s. Um, and uh, same with Maurice Lamarche and Jess Harnell. I mean, it's, it seems like these guys, you know, were we we. I was always working with these guys early on when I was you know, still doing a lot of animation and you got to understand, I haven't really done animation, you know, that much, hardly at all, um, in the last, you know, 10, 15 years. Now I did do Transformers animated for Cartoon Network. Right. Um, you know, but that was sort of a blip, you know, kind of came up for a couple of seasons and then that was gone. But, uh, the animation isn't something that I'm really pursuing that much. I mean, I, I'd, I'd love, I'd love to do it, uh, I guess again, but, um, you know, my 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 days now are are pretty much uh, filled with uh, my work is pretty much all promo network promo now, um, which is something that started in '93 with uh, NBC. So, uh, you know, I'm I'm no longer with NBC. I was with them for 16 years doing all their comedy promos, 
and uh, musty TV promos and all the promos for uh, Jay Leno and the Tonight Show. But um, I do stuff for ABC now and ABC Family and the Hub and and uh, the daily promos for Live with Kelly and Michael. So so it, it it's I'm sort of stuck in promo land. And when I say stuck, I don't mean that in a bad way. Um, you know, I'm listen. I'm thankful just to be working, and uh, and it's a great gig to have. But the point being that you know it sort of precludes me from leaving my house much <laughs> because it's all my work from home and uh and doing and and doing much animation anymore as a, my last question was has how has voice acting changed if at all for you since you first started like with transformers compared to the original ninja turtles uh changed what do you mean in what way like has has um has it gone like does it go by quicker now compared to how it was back then, or is the process a little different with voice acting well i I think the process is still very much like it was when I started you know thirty years ago and and uh you know animation is one of the is one of the few now it's not always done this way still, but for the most part it's it's one of the few gigs that you know you get where you actually go and and you're in a studio with the other uh, actors and you're all together uh doing it it's you get a, a a much better i think you get much better performances out of everybody when when you're together as an ensemble cast and uh i know that nowadays especially in feature animation um they don't they don't do it together as an ensemble it's you know they they bring the stars in to do their lines and and they all do their lines separately uh and uh, you know and then put it all together but um, but in 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 regular old animation, uh, they love having the actors all together because there's it's such a different energy and such a different uh, feel um, that you get in the performance when people are actually playing off of each other. And, you know, and, and there is a lot of hilarity that goes on, too. And oftentimes some of the ad libs that come out of those sessions uh, end up making it their way into, uh, you know, final cuts. So. So I think in that regard, the 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 process of voice acting hasn't changed that much. Now, what I will say is that technologically, obviously, everything has changed in the last 15 years because of, A, the Internet, also computers. Um, everybody can have a studio in their house, you know, for a nickel. Um, and, and so, uh, you know, like I was saying – where I used to go into uh, NBC, for instance, to do all my promos, now I do all my stuff from home with an ISDN box, you know, and I can hook up with anybody around the world with this little gizmo and uh, do my work that way. So from from in that regard, the, the voice acting world has changed enormously for me. I mean, um, because I've I've I, in, in a sense sort of lost the community aspect of it because I just never see anybody anymore. I never go to studios anymore. Um, you know, where it used to be, I had, uh, back in the days when I, you know, had, uh, a, a bunch of a big commercial accounts like Home Depot, for instance, I would have a standing gig over at LA studios every morning at nine. And it, that would be my, you know, m the start to my day, but also a start to my being able to uh, socialize and, and see the, you know, the, the cats that I, I love in this business and, um, you know, the, the, the engineers and the receptionists and the other actors and the writers and producers from ad agencies and such like that, pretty much all that's gone away. And that's been, to me, that's been just a devastating blow to this business because it's all become very insular and isolated and alone, you know, sitting here at the mic in, in my house. Right. So, I mean, is that is was that your question? Yeah, I was just wondering if there was any real process that you've noticed that's changed as of like since you first started. Yeah, I mean, basically the animation, like I said, is is still pretty much done the same way. Everybody, you know, gets together in the studio at, at pretty much the same time, and you lay down your tracks, and then they edit the tracks together and send them off overseas wherever, and and then they animate uh, to the voices, and that's it. So in the animation world, I think it's still basically pretty much the same. All right. And thank you very much for letting me interview you. Yeah, 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 yeah. Thank you, man. Is there uh, any advice you can give to people interested in the whole acting business? Don't do it. <laughs>
<laughs> yeah. It's like, uh, you, you, you gotta, you, you, I mean, you, if somebody really wants to be an actor, uh, then they got to really, really, really want it and be committed to it. And, um, you know, then it's a matter of being where it's happening. So if it's, you know, animation you want to do, uh, you know, get yourself to LA and, and start taking workshops. There's some great animation workshops and acting workshops and singing workshops. And, you know, just, I mean, just immerse yourself in it all you can, which of course requires money. So come, come wealthy and, uh, you know, and then, and then st stick to it and just, you know, meet as many people as you can try and get a decent, put together a great demo. Um, these are all elements that, that, that play into, uh, anybody being a, a, a you know, having even a, a, a remote shot at, at, um, you know, making their dream come true. But if it's something you really want, then, then go for it, but commit to it. Yeah. You know, I've seen too many people ask me that question over the years and then, you know, and say, well, I'm going to, I'm going to come out to LA and I'm going to give it a try. I'm going to give it six months or give it a year. And it's like, dude, you know, don't even bother if, if, I mean, come out with no kind of, you know, end in sight and just commit to it and, and, you know, stay until it happens. Um, but you got to really, 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 really want it. All right. And thank you so much. Yeah, you bet, guys. Well, thanks. Uh, and stop the recording.